inspire all of us gathered here. Hope you all are good and safe. Thank you for taking your valuable time out and being here with us to all around the world. A general reminder, please follow the instructions during the webinar for the smooth functioning of the program. Be sure to mute your audio so that there is no disturbance during the sessions. If you have any queries, please type those into the Zoom or YouTube live chat box. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. The feedback form of the webinar will be available at the end of the program. Department of Biosciences, Union Christian College, Alava, Kerala, and Nasi Kerala chapter proudly presents to you a webinar on the topic Gene Editing Definitions and Perspectives by Dr. Anjan K. Banerjee, Indian Institute of Science, Education, and Research, Pune, as a part of our ongoing centenary webinar lecture series. We have a blood principal, Dr. Tara K. Simon, Manager Reverend Father Thomas John, former bark scientist and our adjunct faculty member, Dr. Susan Epen, head of Department of Biosciences, Mr. Shyam Mohan, faculty coordinator of the program, Dr. Tarin Saraja, and other faculty members of UC College. Before we begin, let us invoke the Almighty's presence and blessings in this gathering, for which I request you all to close your eyes for silent prayer. Now, I invite Dr. Susan Epen, former bulk scientist and our adjunct faculty member, for welcome address. A very good morning to all of you. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar organized by National Academy of Sciences, NASI, Prayagraj, Kerala Chapter, and hosted by Union Christian College, Aluwa, Kerala, which is completing its centenary this year. First of all, let me welcome today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Anjan Banerjee of AIS Pune. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Banerjee. Thank you. Former Vice Chancellor, Kerala Agriculture University, and former Director, ICAR IISR Calicut, and Chairman Nasi Kerala Chapter, we are privileged to have Professor K. V. Peter with us. Welcome, sir, for today's program. I use this opportunity to welcome. Professor Edathil Vijayan, former ICMR medical scientist, UGC visiting professor and convener of today's program for this webinar. Welcome, sir, to this program. I am happy to welcome Dr. Deepu Matthew, Secretary of NASI, Kerala Chapter, and all other distinguished NASI fellows and members, and also fellows of other academies for this webinar. I am pleased to welcome Reverend Thomas John, manager, UC College, and Dr. Tara K. Simon, principal UC College for today's webinar. Lastly, it is my pleasure to welcome all the participants from all over India and from abroad for today's function. A warm welcome to all of you once again. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now, I would like to invite <coughs> Dr. Erathi Vijayan Nazi for a talk. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, on behalf of NASI Kerala chapter, it's my proud privilege to welcome you all and the distinguished speaker, Dr. Banerjee, 
our chairman of Kerala chapter, Dr. Peter, our secretary, Dr. Dev Matthew, uh, Dr. Susan Epen, the principal of the college, UC College, Aluai, and the Department of Biosciences. Now, as I told you, the NASI, probably uh, all of you know, or many of, most of you know, it's called the National Academy of Sciences, India, headquartered in Prayagraj, uh, former Allahabad. This academy was established by one of the distinguished sons of India, the physicist Meghnan Saha in 1930. This was the first science academy in the country. And the mandate of the academy was to formulate, advise guidelines, advise the government in execute, implementing and executing science policy, science and technology policy in the country. That's the main mandate. Plus the academy recognize the distinguished scientists in the country by way of awarding fellowships and other awards in excellence in science to both uh, young scientists as well as the active scientists who are researching and also the scientists who are we call emeritus and by way of offering various uh, uh, research awards and uh, financial support to continue their research. <clears throat> One of the recent thrust of the academy uh, is to take science or reach science and technology to the unreached. And uh, the young students in the colleges and universities through various uh, chapters which are across, uh, spread across the country in almost all states, we have the chapters and Kerala was, chapter was inaugurated in the year 19, 2019. And we have been, uh, our president, <coughs> Dr. Peter, has been very active in organizing various science and technology related programs uh, since last uh, several months. And due to the pandemic, we have been having it online. Now this, today's program, which was organized jointly by our Kerala chapter of NASI and Union UC College, Aluai, on the, celebrating their 100th year of uh, establishment. So the society, is, the NASI is uh, privileged and honored to be part of this uh, uh, today's <clears throat> program, and I congratulate the principal and administrative staff, Dr. Susan Nippon, and the faculty and students of UC College Alway in <clears throat> taking this opportunity and grabbing this opportunity and arranging an excellent lecture on gene editing by one of the authorities in India by Dr. Anjan Banerjee from Pune. So I wish the lecture, Dr. Banerjee's lecture will be beneficial to all the researchers and the students in uh, biological sciences or life sciences or biotechnology. So with these few words, I wish uh, today's program a great success. And uh, one word for the students, we have, the academies have several programs uh, intended for the students of undergraduate and postgraduate and also research by way of offering, we offer the summer research program, summer, it's called summer research fellowship for UG and PG students, where they can utilize the vacation two months in any laboratory in India. The academy full, fully supports their travel, their uh, um, stay, and also a pocket allowance of uh, 10,000 rupees per month. These two months. So in order to encourage the young students not to waste their summer vacation, 
they can uh, choose on their own a mentor in any laboratory in India and uh, the academy makes the selection. It's a tough uh, selection because we have uh, close to 4,000 uh, fellowships, but the competition is also uh, tough. But yet many students are benefited and they can associate with them any senior scientist and work on their own problem. That's more important. The students have the freedom to choose, to visualize or to envisage their own research problem, which can be tackled in two months. So they spend the entire support. So this is a program which I would like to remind for the benefit of the students. With these few words, uh, I'm happy to welcome all of you once more on behalf of the uh, Kerala chapter of the Academy. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I will now call upon Dr. Susan Epen, former bath scientist and our urgent faculty member to introduce our guest speaker for the day. Dr. Anjan Banerjee is currently Professor and Dean R&D, Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, ISER, Pune. Earlier, he did his postdoctoral research associateship at Iowa University, USA from 2001 to 2008. His research interests vary from long distance RNA transport and signaling, microRNAs and target gene regulation plant developmental biology and evolution of land plants. He has received Tata Innovation and a Fellowship Award of Department of Biotechnology Government of India in 2021. He is a fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences, Bengaluru and National Academy of Sciences, India Prayagraj, and currently he is also Dean of R&D at ISA Pune. His professional membership include American Society of Plant Biologists, USA, Society of Experimental Biology, UK, Plant Vascular Biology, USA, Society of Indian Cell Biology, PTCA in short, and many other membership, yes. His number of publications is about 41 with H index of 90 with a total citations of 1,900. He has four book chapters and four patents to his credit. He has guided seven PhD students and several students are currently doing PhD under his guidance. He has eight talks under inter in the international symposia and 58 in national symposia. His research funding is from Department of Biotechnology, CSIR, DST CERB and uh, currently ongoing two projects and he has completed eight projects. Today he will enlighten us on the topic gene editing definitions and perspectives. Dr. Banerjee please. Thank you madam. Thank you. I'll share the screen first and then I will Is my screen visible? Yes, it is visible. It is visible. Wonderful. I'll make it full screen. Yeah. Is it clear now? Yes, it is clear. All right. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to this webinar. First of all, I'm 
thankful to Dr. Susan Epen for inviting me to give a webinar in your college as part of the NASI Kerala chapter. I am also grateful to the college authorities and all distinguished scientists uh, for allowing me to speak here. Let me, let me admit in the beginning, I am not an expert in gene editing. When I was invited, I, I, I discussed with your madam and I said, I would rather be, feel very comfortable to speak on the area of research that I practice every day. But then she said, you can speak on gene editing. And then I finally, I agreed. I said, all right, I will try my best. So let us see what I, what I have learned um, over the years. And we have very little research that we do with respect to the gene editing in our lab. I will share my experience as well. But today what I share, all the, all the slides, all the results, all the findings that I'll share, that will be all from others' work, not mine work, okay? So I, I don't think I'm an expert. I am like you, I'm learning along with you. And if there are any mistakes, if there are any concerns, you feel free to raise me the questions, ask me the questions, and I'll try my best to satisfy your answer, okay? So it, will, it may take around 50, 55 minutes. I have a number of slides. Uh, I have a lot of old information. I have a lot of new information. And I hope you will enjoy, uh, especially the students, you will realize that where the subject has gone today. From the discovery till date, where we are, what we have learned, and what we can learn and where we want to go. Okay, so let's begin. Thank you again. Let me let me start this. Let me start this talk. The title I have given: Gene Editing Definitions and Perspectives. So I think for me, definitions is important. Do I really know that what gene editing is? I have I've given you a cartoon here for the students to understand. That look at what gene editing really means. Basically, it's a cut and paste. You can cut a DNA molecule. Okay, if you want to cut a strand, you can. If you want to cut a single base, that also you can. That's what it is today. And that, that gives us the enormous advantage what we can think of, right? 20, 30 years of research that you will get to see in my slides, slide after slide that I have, I have prepared for you to share that what, what we knew and what we like to know now, okay? So that's all about it. Myself, Anjan Banerjee, as the kind introduction that Dr. Susan has given, I'm thankful again, and I'm honored. Let me, let me continue. What is gene editing? Genome editing or gene editing allows researchers to add, remove, or to alter the genetic material at desired locations in the genome. Okay, wherever you want to do, wherever you want to add, wherever you want to delete, wherever you want to insert, all possibilities exist today, and we can harness that potential and do the best, okay? So that's the definition. But let me let me also tell you, we are talking about gene editing, genome editing. But we have, I don't know how many of us, and especially I'm, I'm talking about students, how many of us really know the early experiment that laid the foundation of our understanding today. Hershey and Chase has done the phenomenal work in 1940s. Okay, uh, Watson and Crick did the uh, the work on structure of DNA molecule. But but I think this. Two people, the pioneer people in 1940s, okay, they did the fundamental phenomenal work to let us know that DNA is indeed the genetic material. In the early 19th, 20th century, scientists debated whether genes were made of DNA or protein, whether protein is the genetic material or DNA is the genetic material. People thought, people, people had a skepticism because protein is being more complex, protein will be the genetic material. But Hershey and Chase did the work and they showed us that no, it is the DNA is the genetic so long standing debate about the composition of genes what it is and what it is made of it is made of the dna and dna is indeed the genetic material this is this is professor hershey and this is uh, dr martha chase and they did that pioneering work when was it you can imagine you know those those days when they did the that they realized that bacteriophage when it infects the cell the bacteria it it transfers its dna and it, this DNA then transfers from one generation to another generation. And that's the genetic material we are talking about. They did the work, they labeled the protein, the sulfur of the protein, they labeled with radioactive isotope. And similarly, the, phosph the phosphorus of the DNA molecule, they labeled with radioisotope. And thereby, they, they allowed the bacteriophage to engulf the, engulf the E. coli, uh, the bacteria. And then finally, from the, from the generation, the subsequent generation, they identified the DNA is the transmitting material, not the protein. And that was I'm talking about today. Thereafter, 1953, it was Watson and Crick who, who developed the structure of the DNA, how does it look? That's the beginning. That, that I think we should not forget. We must even you know, go back and look at those experiments, what made the foundation today for us to understand. 
Uh, of course, he was uh, he was awarded a um, Nobel Prize in 1969. Max, along with other people, Max Delbruck, Alfred G. Hershey, and Salvador Luria. Uh, she was not. She was not given. She was she was a co-worker with uh, uh, with uh, Professor Alfred, uh, Professor Hershey, and that's why they got. She did not get the, uh, uh, the, the Nobel Prize. History of genome editing. If you look at it, let me let me read for you, and I think you will you will also appreciate that what it is. It was 1973 when Herb Boyer and Stanley Cohen created the first chemically engineered organism, a bacteria with an added gene to confer antibiotic resistance in Cohen Stanford University lab. Okay, what was what was what happened in 82? The first genetically engineered human drug, synthetic insulin, came up in 1982, produced by bacteria that contain the human insulin gene, is approved by the Food and Drug Administration (FDA). 1994, which is the company Colgene, introduced the first genetically engineered food. The flavor saver, which was which is engineered to stay to stay firm when ripe, it's the it's the tomato. 1994 discovery. All these discoveries is because of the editing, replacement or addition of a new gene in the genome. That's the beginning. Okay. 1996. It was Monsanto released released its first genetically modified crops. Okay. Within a few years, Roundup Ready corn, soybeans, cotton, sugar beets, canola dominate the dominated the market. Shortly thereafter, roundup resistant weeds begin to appear in fields where those crops. Of course, this is a consequence of the genetic genetic modification, genetic engineering that we talk about, genome editing that we talk about. Okay, so that means genome editing is not something that we have started ten years back. It was started long back. Okay, 1980s, 80s, our, our early experiments of 1981, 82, 83 resulted in this this kind of pioneering discoveries that we are all uh, we all uh, can benefit out. of. 2012, researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, and the Broad Institute independently discovered that CRISPR, it was 2012, a bacterial immune system can be adapted to serve as a gene editing tool that can make specific changes to DNA anywhere in an organism. Think about this, it was just 2012, you know, nine to 10 years back. Okay. 2014, what happened? It was Kevin published a paper demonstrating how CRISPR could be used to drive a genetic modification. So all members of a population, this is called gene drive, is a, is a new, new, new way of, of understanding that gene editing has now been now, now known. It's called gene drive, permanently altering or eradicating them. Okay, it's not a, we are not talking about a single base. We're not talking about a single strand. We are talking about a gene drive. I will show you. I have examples to to explain this mechanism to you. He proposes using this use it to control invasive species and to eliminate diseases such as limb disease. Lyme disease uh, and malaria, and I have the example to, at the end I'll show you. 2015, scientists at the University of California and San, in San Diego built the first gene drive in a lab-based population of fruit flies. Okay, today, that's what it is. We can think about, okay, the mechanism of gene drive. Uh, an Imperial College in London builds the first gene drive in lab mosquitoes. You can, you can, you can suppress genes which, or even if, you know, a population that, Example, we'll see. Research teams in Texas and Australia announced gene drive house uh, in house mice. The first use of gene drive in a mammal. It was only 2017 then when such, and such an experiment was conducted in in the lab in the house mice. The gene drive is now popular. The first gene altering treatments for cancer are approved by by F, by the FDA. Okay, so this was the this is the history, and from this history, where we are going, which way we are we are targeting now. But even before we talk about today's gene editing techniques and today's gene editing tools that we have in our hand, we shouldn't forget that, that what are the other observations that made us, because we are, I, of course I come from a plant background, so I'm a plant scientist. You know, 19, 1907, the first observation that people had that the plant can also develop humor. And when later on, at the 70, 80 years, people took to understand that what is the cause of this tumor? Why plant gets this tumor? 1980-81, people realized that it is nothing but a bacteria which causes transfer its DNA to the plant cell, alters the plant cell metabolism, cell cycle, and thereby there is an abnormal growth. And that's how they realized that it is nothing but a bacteria which transfers its DNA, and, and they named it as an agrobacterium. It was, it was 1980s when we people, of course, this observation was 1907. It was Townsend who did, who, who, who did this. Um, observations in his backyard. But even before, if you see 1897, the written record that you can see that what the first written record of crown gall disease in 1853, written record, 1907, the first observation. 
the in the that stones and made in the in a, in a, in a German botanist. And then it took 70, 75 years in 1980s, we see the modifications in the gene that we could do with the help of recombinant DNA biology. Because 1960s, 70s, 80s, we have pioneering discoveries. Right, right after you can think about sequencing, restriction, and restriction, enzymes, your PCR, all these were those years when people could do all sorts of deletions, additions, and modifications, and thereby they could think about alterations of the gene. Using this technique, they are later on, people, scientists, explore this technique because the bacteria transfer the DNA from its own genome to the plant cell and alter the plant cell metabolism. Thereby, the, 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 the outcome is the, is, the, is the tumor. And that is what people have, people have looked at over the years. And, and uh, just a second, I will take my um, uh, laser here. It will help me uh, to point out. Yes. And in over the years, what people have looked at is that you can you can manipulate this TDNA. You can remove the, the auxin coding gene, you can remove the cytokinin coding gene, and you can put the gene of your interest. Bacteria will not know what it is transferring. It will only transfer this to the plant cell, and plant cell thereby will express that gene of interest. And you can really change that to what it is. It is nothing but a, what it is. It is genome editing, right? You have done that, you have transferred a gene of your interest. Similarly, you can even replace a gene of interest from the genome. That's all I possible. 80s, we have seen that. 90s, we have seen those kind of phenomenal scientific work. We have seen how we can improve the trade. How, that's how all these corns, I mean, Watson, people have developed by these technologies. Okay? So I'm sure um, many, of the, many of the students over here, they will know this. And if, if, if you do not, you must read and enjoy re reading that literature. That what is the, what, have, what is the, you know, uniqueness of this kind of technologies, right? Okay, so th this is this is what in short it is. You can transfer your gene of interest, whichever gene you think about. You can clone the gene here and and make it to insert into the plant cell genome, and thereby you can raise the the, the novel plant with phenotypic you know, traits. Either it's a ill or it's conferring resistance or it's conferring stress resistance. All sorts of things you can think of, think about. A amazing genetic engineering dominated 80s, 90s, and the last decade as well, okay? That's the editing, genome editing via that period of time, okay? So it continues, okay? But what is that we see now in one of the disadvantage of this kind of transfer of genes from bacteria to plants and using the bacterial vector um, and let the bacteria transfer, it, it is, I, it's a, we are dependent, we are, you know, it's a bacterial choice. Where would the bacterial gene will insert? I had no knowledge. We had no knowledge. We, we knew that it has a random insertion. It can insert anywhere in the genome. It can replace or it, or it can permanently turn off a gene. That's also possible. Of course, the technology allow us to identify southern blotting. Many of the molecular tools allow us to know that where the insertion happened from the DNA, from the bacteria to the plant cell. But it, we are depending on that. And scientists came up with new and newer technologies. And that's where the new, new era of genome editing started. Okay, that's what I'm trying to tell all the students who are participating in this, in this webinar. That 80s, 90s, 2000, that last decade, you will see enormous literature, numerous literatures on agrobacterium. Of course, people later on came up with physical devices because we did not want it to depend on the agrobacterium. We wanted to come up with our own choice of target delivery of DNA or of the gene of interest, the plant cell. Okay, so then we came up with a physical device. And those physical devices are gene gun, helium gun, electroporations, um, laser, laser assisted gene drive, and all, all, all sorts of things dominated, right? Lab to lab, people explored all, tough, all sorts of techniques because agrobacterial mediated agrobacteria mediated transport is a natural process. It's a natural genetic engineering, natural genome editing. We wanted to do even far better. But even that last 30 years, as I said, the first paper, if you see the first genetically modified plants, um, 1983, the nature paper, the science paper, the tobacco, okay, it was genetically modified. Okay, and, and I'm saying now that with the, with the newer technologies, we have now come up with, people have now devised, discovered synthetic endonuclease that can precisely make a cut in the DNA wherever you want. That's the difference. I hope you point this, you can distinguish the previous era and the current. What is now done? We people, scientists have, uh, again, I, I'm a learner, try to understand this fact. We have now the synthetic nucleases 
that allows you to make a precise cut in the DNA wherever you want. It could be an insertion, could be a deletion, and you can make the end joining. And then accordingly, you can do all sorts of manipulations. You can think about all sorts of phenotypic traits that you would like to look, that you like to expect. And that is what the need for targeted double stranded drug generation called DSBs and target sites modulation. Invention of reprogrammable nuclease. The first reprogrammable nuclease is, is, the, is the ZFN, the zinc finger nuclease. Okay, the ZFN, the first one is here on the left hand side, you can see the ZFN. Then came talent, the transcription activation, like effector nuclease, and then came CRISPR. So it's an era of nuclease, synthetic nuclease that gave you the superpower to, to even modify at a very, very precise level exactly where you want. That was not possible. And that's the difference. Okay. So now you see here what I have explained to you that you have ZFN, which is zinc finger nuclease, you have talent transcription activator like effector nuclease, and then we'll go to Vista, which everyone knows, but I don't know how many of you know that ZFN. The, in, the, in the series of discoveries, it was ZFN, then came the talent, and then came the Krishna. Okay, but I, I will show you the parallel discoveries and those pioneers, right? Um, they made, made, made all of us, you know, uh, to, to, to think about beyond the box. Okay, so it, what it does, might have slides later on, but here in short, it will make the precise cut, and in the double strand, you can make a non, non homology based. End joining. It's called NHEG, non homology based end joining. You can also think about a homology directed repair because it's a cell's endogenous, endogenous mechanism. Cells will not like to be, the DNA strand will not like to be like this. It has to join. The cell has those mechanisms of DNA repair, NHEG, non homology based end joining, DHDR, homology, homology directed repair. And by those mechanisms, it will either join the double strand or, or it will make the the, the vice versa, whichever way it is. Okay, so continue. And uh, this is what I was talking about that NHEG, the non homology based, non homologous end joining, and you have homologous recombination. So, because of recombination, you can either make a gene modification here, you see the donor DNA, you make a recombination event here, and thereby you can insert it. Okay, on the other hand, here you can make a complete knockout because it's a non homologous end joining. You give the donor DNA here, you can make a complete gene insertion. Based exploring these endogenous tools now, with and along with the, with the discoveries of synthetic nucleases like ZFN and Talem, and then came CRISPR, people have now a biologists have now much more to do in, in, in next, next decade after decades. So let's say what is ZFN here. Okay, the first generation reprogrammable nucleus, ZFN zinc finger, it's a domain, it's a zinc finger, it's a it it is it, it is a fusion nuclease along with another restriction enzyme, domain of another restriction enzyme known as FOC1. The FOC1 domain, the cleavage domain of the FOC1 and the zinc finger domain, it's a fusion endonuclease, and it works better because zinc finger domain will bind to the target DNA and FOC1 will make the cut five to six base pair from where it sits. I have the third to show you. That's precisely it, okay? The, the, and it is when? It is 2000, 2009, if I'm, I cannot show you because of this uh, band here. Yeah, but you can see here that it is, it is sometimes around 2008 or 2009. How many years? 12 years, 12, 13 years back discoveries, okay? Um, if, you if, you, if you continue, huh, if you continue, let me explain this, how, it, how does it work? And I will give you an example as well. So zinc finger nuclease has a potential reagents to create double stranded bracts in normal genes. It, has a, it works as a dimer. What it does, the dimer, it sits on the opposite strands of the DNA. This is your target here, okay? So this is the one, one dimer. It's a monomer of zinc finger, ZFN, one the enzyme, the nuclease. It binds here and other domain binds here. And your FOC1, FOC1, which is a, which is a synthetic, which is a fused enzyme, that the cleavage domain of FOC1 sits here. But please remember, this ZFN, when it binds, it only needs nine to 18 base pairs of DNA right here. It binds there. Precisely, you can, you can, you can modulate that and make a target selections as well. And that's the advantage of these technologies, okay? Uh, and when FOC1 cuts here, unlike any other restriction enzyme, it cuts five to six base pairs away from the place where it binds. 
That's the advantage. So you can think about why it is cutting, which face is replacing, which gene is going to be altered, which gene is going to be disturbed. All sorts of things you can plan ahead. So it makes a target cleavage. After the cleavage, either it can go to a not NHEG mode of repair or it can go via the HR mediated repair of the cell endogenous pathway. Accordingly, either it will be a, it will be an addition or it will be a gene mutation that we are thinking about. The draw, what's the ad advantage? How to assemble a new, you can think about a new zinc finger protein? Yes, by altering the contact residues. I showed you five to nine to 12 base pair residues. If in a target sequence, you can think about how, how do I design the zinc finger nucleus? By mixing different fingers, one can assemble a zinc finger protein with a new target site specificity. So specific, okay? Theoretically, if, we, if, you if one had zinc fingers for all 64 possible triplets, one could assemble a zinc finger protein to recognize any sequence that you want. It still has, in spite of that much of advantage, it still has a disadvantage. Sometimes it is off target. And see, I have mentioned here, sometimes it, even though you have designed so much, it still has an off target effect. It sits somewhere else, cuts the other gene. That's the problem. You can't even think about what am I doing here. Okay. Designing sometimes is a little time consuming. It will, you require a little bit of thinking how it has to be done. If less versatile, the different design is often limited by the lack of suitability of the target sequence. If you, if you don't find it a suitable target sequence, you cannot design a ZFN enzyme, synthetic enzyme that will allow me to focus on restriction and so on. What is, the, what is an example? A classic example I will show you here. Imagine this, this plant. It's a, it's a, it's a mute. It is transformed with a gas, it's a reporter gene. Now the gas gene is mutated, so you don't get to see an expression. And it is shown here. So it, it, this green sequences are nothing but the ZFN recognition sequence. Okay, you have a stop cotton here, purposefully inserted. Now because of this stop cotton, the plant is not will not show you the the gas gene activity, the blue color. It, it will be a mutated gas plant. Okay. Now how do you? That's the advantage of ZFN. Now you take that plant. You, you, you take a viral vector, maybe tobacco retal virus, and put the ZFN into that tobacco retal virus. Let the virus infect the plant. Wherever the virus goes, you have a ZFN sitting on this. It's, it, it's a, it, it, will, it will reach to even the meristem of the plant. And what ZFN will do, ZFN will sit here. It will, it, and with the help of your FOC1, FOC1 restriction endonuclease, restriction enzyme, it will, it will cut here. Your stop cotton will go. Top cotton, as a result, you see the next sequence. Top cotton is no more there. Your gas will be activated. And then when you test this, you see the gas gene is showing you blue color. That precision, it's an example, classic example, that you can precisely target a gene of your interest. Okay. Most interestingly, even if you even say, for example, new plant coming out from the shoot apex, like say shoot apex, this this it can be, it is transmissible to the next generation either. So F1, F2, you can look at the, the phenotype is, uh, or, the, or the trait is transferred. That is, that is what I'm trying to tell you, that, the, that people have designed, biologists have come up with the ZFN technology and that precise it is today. Now, right after that, I have many examples for other, other, other tools. For ZFN, I only chose one to explain to you. The next, next programmable nuclease was the TELEN, the transcription activation, activator-like effector nucleus called TAILS. The transcription factor, it was identified from Genthomonas bacteria. What does it do? It, it also works pretty much similar like ZFN nucleus, okay? And that ZFN system. I written here that like ZFN, stellums are modular in form and function and function um, com comprised of an amino terminal tail DNA binding domain fused to a carboxy terminal POC1 cleavage domain. So now if you see this, if you see this, what it does is that Maybe it's not working. Huh, see, what does it do? So it goes there, it sits, it enters the plant cell, it sits on the target DNA, and your transcription factor binds, and that's how it activates the gene function. Precisely. Okay. Subsequent slide, you will see the mechanism of talent. Okay. It is remembered, it is a discovery in 2009, secreted by Xanthomonas bacteria by type 3 secretion system. It binds promoter sequence, the regulatory elements in the host plant, recognize plant DNA sequence precisely, and, and does the job. Okay. Now, see, this is how the talent, talent looks like. Okay. Um, talent, this is a DNA binding domain. It will, through this domain, through this domain it will bind to the target, target gene in the regulatory element. 
And here, I have shown you here, you have seen that each of these has 34 amino acids. 34 amino acids requires to, to recognize one single amino, one single base in the target sequence. I'll show you this, how beautiful it is, it does. That's precise it is. So now if you see what happens here, you can, of course, you can design here. If, uh, this, this stands for single, these bases. You can think about how the target modulations will happen. We can, we can see. So now see the engineered central repeat domain. This is your TLM DNA binding domain. You can think, you can make all sorts of modulations here. And now if you allow it to bind, it will bind, see, I was telling you the 34 amino acids requires, recognizes single nucleotide right here in the target sequence. You always need a T, remember, in a target gene, whenever you design, it's a, it's a prerequisite of a T nucleotide preceding the DNA target sequence. So a, we have seen that in multiple examples established that you require in the target sequence such a, such a T, which will be preceding the, pre, preceding the target sequence, okay? And that's how it binds. After that, what happens? So your talent, it, it see this what happens. It, it binds to your target, target sequence. There's a two talent, talent A and talent B, and you have the POC1 dimer. It works like a, if you have a screwdriver, the screwdriver, what you do when you remove the screw, you, you often change the adapter based on the screw head. And that's exactly it is. So you can precisely think about that. How would I, I mean, you can, you can, you can POC1 that, that domain I was talking about. It's a fusion of, fusion of POC1 cleavage domain, as well as the talent, talent DNA binding domain, transcription factor. And what it does is you can, you can go and modulate those, those for one flip domain, you can think about phosphorylations, you can think about fumylation, all sorts of protein modifications you can think about by changing this, the head. And accordingly, what will happen? It will cut the double strand DNA, and thereby you can think about either a mutation, you can think about the insertion, you can think about the complete um, deletion of the, of the DNA. Cell. Okay, that's how the, the technology works. Now you can take this technology. Here is, a, here is an example for you to know. Many of you may think, many of you may work on plants and think and, and must know that there are transgenic plants are generated with the selectable marker. And that's a concern. Now Telen offers us a great opportunity to, to remove a selectable marker gene very precisely from the plant. See that how it works. So you, you have a remember I showed you the bacterial, bacterial cassette where we had a left border and right border. It was from the agrobacterium. It is nothing but a tDNA. You can engineer the tDNA and see what it is. The GOI stands for your gene of interest, okay, driven by a promoter. You have a unique identical talent binding site just flanking the 35S SMG called selectable marker gene. It could be, it could be canamycin or it could be many other selectable marker gene. What you have to do is that you can just cleverly flank it with the identical talent binding site and, and, and put it on the plant. Okay, you know all sorts of ways that. You can, you can infuse this into the plant and plant will harbor this. The moment talent is active, the talent, talent enzyme, endonuclease, what it will do, it will bind to that recognized sequence in this binding site and make a cut right here. Okay, make a cut right here. See in the both the sites. As a result, your SMD, your selectable marker gene will be precisely deleted from the genome. And, and that it shows you. You will be left with your GOI, which is your gene of interest, given by the promoter, and repaired, your broken ends will be repaired. Your SMG, which is nothing but the selectable marker gene, will be deleted. Kellen offers us that opportunity. Kellen offers us that sort of engineering that we can think about. And it is, there are, there, I'm giving you one example. If you browse literature, you'll find so many technologies are now, so many ways that people have now used Kellen to precisely remove the selectable marker gene from the plant. We are thinking about that genome editing. Okay. So I showed you an example of agrobacterium mated last 30 years, 40 years of genetic engineering, followed by we have reprogrammable synthetic nucleus like ZFN, like talent transcription, the talent that I just now mentioned. And we are I'm going towards the CRISPR, which will be which many of you know. Okay. So let me show you one more example of talent, I believe. Okay, this is done in potato. So very precisely what you can do that talent mediated targeted DNA insertions in production. You use the talent, talent has two, two, two of its act effector, the, the domain which will, which will be required. It's a talent vector. It's your donor vector, which is, which is driven by the left border and the right border. And you want this to be inserted into the, finally into the genome. 
And you see, because of the talent talent technology, talent enzyme, you know, it made a cut here, and that by this. Uh, by this DNA damage DNA repair mechanism, you got this portion got introduced into your target locus. That's the schematic strategy of targeted tDNA insertion by talent. You can see this paper. I have given many references here, slide by slide. Those of you are interested can go to those reports, go to those papers and see what it talks about, what sort of technology it talks about. There is another example I'll give you. This is this is Markensian, plant biologist, plant student, plant student from Botany and other. They might know this Markensia. Markensia has air chamber. It, you know, they have this kind of, if you look at the wild type Markensia, they have this kind of air chamber in their, in their talus. Now, you can precise, you, are, you, want to, you want to precisely target the gene which is, which is responsible for this phenotype. The protein is called NOP1. NOP1, you can precisely target. So what you can do, you, you can again think about a talent strategy. You see talent strategy, that we have done this kind of DNA binding dimer. You have a talent, it is fused with POC1. It will target the, no, the MOP1 no, no gene and it will mutate it. As a result, when the mutant line that you have got, there is no air chamber. Not a single air chamber is present. That precise it is. Okay. I hope this explains to you that what I am talking about with respect to the genome. Now come back to the next programmable. Nucleus. Okay, so now the most recent addition in the genome editing tool of reprogrammable nucleus. Okay, what it is, all of us know, it is clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic C repeats. In short, it is known as CRISPR. And what is Cas9? It is a CRISPR associated endonuclease known as Cas. CRISPR associated endonuclease known as Cas9. Okay, we will see how it works, and then we'll take the example to know. Um, the mode of action and, and, and the beauty of this mechanism. Okay. Now, if you go back in the literature, it is you will see that it is 1987 again. There was a discovery made, and what, what is the discovery? Is Yoshimi Ishino in Japan Osaka University? He identified a YAP gene. What is the YAP gene? It is it is an isoenzyme alkaline phosphorylase gene from E. coli. As part of his work, he must have identified this gene. Colleagues published a sequence of a gene called YAP from E. coli. That's all. That was the discovery in 87. Okay, the founder that made the discovery of CRISPR. You will try to relate it. You see, scientists they wanted to know that how these genes function. Basically, they wanted to know whether whether there are protein which binds to the upstream regulatory elements of this of gene. What they did, they wanted to sequence the upstream or downstream and see are there any protein binding domain? Are there any protein binding sequences? The scientists also sequence some of the DNA surrounding it hoping to find some protein binding motifs, but found something else. And that's the beginning. Now, what did they find? Look at it. This is your, sorry, this is, this is your YAP gene, okay, that they identified, okay. It's an isoenzyme and it's an alkaline phosphatase. Fine, that's all, but nothing so great. But look at what they identified. They identified here, this, you notice this, you will notice my, uh, there's a pointer, one, two, three, four, five. So this five, I'll, I'll remove this. Um, this five is 29, 29 base pair repeat, exact repeat. One, two, three, four, five. 29 base pair exact repeat. Interspaced by spacers. These spacers are 30. These spacers are these spacers are 34. One second, give me. Huh. So this, sorry for that, sorry for the interruption. And, and I was talking about that these are spacers, one, two, three, four. These are, these are 32 base pair unique spacer. In this. That's the observation they had. When was it? 87, okay? You have 20, it's a sandwich, you can think about it. You have, you have unique, repeat, 529 base pair, 20, these are 29 base pair, the repeat, interspaced by Spacers of 32 base pairs. So it's a spacer, repeat, spacer, repeat, like it's a sandwich model. It's, it's, it is known as clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic sequence. That's the name came from CRISPR. Okay. That's the observations in 87. Now look at this. The biological significance of this sequence was certainly not known at that time. How, was, how did it start? 1990, 87, we had this observation by Yushumi Ishino in, in Osaka University in Japan. What happened in 1990? 
they found similar sequences in other microbes. Okay, it was not only restricted to E. coli, they found it in other sequences as well. In 2002, so 10 years later, 1990 and 2002, 10 to 12 years later, Rod Johnson from Utrecht University in the Netherlands and colleagues named this sandwich. The name came in 2002, Fishper. Okay, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. Name is Fishper. Johnson's team also noticed that Fishper sequences always accompanied by a collection of genes nearby. And that's the cats, CRISPR associated genes. They named them as CAS genes for CRISPR associated genes. Function they did not know. 87 that discovery, the YAV gene, the, 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 the sandwich kind of repeats, spacer versus rep, unique repeats. 2002, they named it, uh, 1990, they found it in many other microbes. 2002, they named it the CRISPR. The genes encoded enzymes that could cut the gene when more and more. More and more, because we have now advanced technology, we can sequence, we can look at the function, so many things. So they realize that these gene, genes and coded enzymes that could cut the DNA. Okay, and this is the paper, 2002. The, we, have, we appreciate their characteristic structure. We will refer to this family as a cluster. First time CRISPR name in 2000. Before that, it was not named CRISPR. Okay, that's the paper all about. Jensen did that. Jensen and two Jensen and, and, his, and his group. Now, this is the chronology. Now, look at, I made it mark purposefully to take your attention here. What happened in 2005? CRISPR, from discovery to gene editing tool, it became a, it was a discovery. Now, it became a fantastic gene editing tool today. No one thinks beyond CRISPR. Okay, if you don't do CRISPR, you are not a great scientist. That's how it has been now safe. So 1987, first discovery of E. coli, fantastic. 1993, they found it in, in, in mycobacterium tuberculosis. 2005, the discovery of Sequence similarity between the spacer region of CRISPR and the sequence of that. This is the observation happened in 2005. They realized that that similar sequence similarity with the bacterial fudge. Why it's a bacteria that they identified from. Bacterial fudge is a virus. And they identified the sequence similarity in 2005. 2012, it turned out to be, it, 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 it turned out a great genome editing thing. Okay. So back to your fudge. Take a point here. It was they identified the sequence similarity. A bacterial DNA sequence is similar, quite similar to the bacterial part DNA. And science named this technology in 2015. This part is a breakthrough technology of the world. They awarded the, the, the scientists who discovered it. Okay, we all feel proud about that. In 2005, it was a breakthrough discovery of the science name. Imagine. Okay, and today, this part Cas9 system turned out to be one of the that we can take an advantage of and make the precise genomedicine genome editing that we want to do. What is the characteristics of the CRISPR? Located in the it is located in the intergenic regions, contain multiple short direct repeats with very little sequence variation. The repeats are interspaced with non-conserved sequence, a common leader sequence. You need at least a few hundred sequence, which, which is called as a leader sequence, 100 base pairs, is located on one side of the repeat cluster. So this Interspace model at the end, you will see a, a, a specific 100 to 200 base pairs of called a leader sequence. That also you need. That's what is the common characteristics of, of, of this for mechanism. Last five years, not last five years, my information is quite old here. You can see here there's a scientific stampede happened. When is it happened? It happened in 2005. The number of articles related to CRISPR almost tripled compared with the combined growth rate of other two, other three methods. Your ZFN, your Talon, and your meganucleus. I did not describe the meganucleus, what it is. Okay, you can look at the literature. Meganucleus, ZFN, Talon, people were, were doing the genome editing. But these three, the total publications, and your CRISPR mediated publications, people, that's the scientific stampede we are talking about. The advantage of this technology. Okay. As I said, it was it was a breakthrough prize in 2015. These two great lady scientists were awarded Nobel Prize in 2020. They also got the breakthrough prize in 2015. You know, um, two to three million US dollars, close to probably 10 to 15 crores or even more, I believe. That. Okay, if you look at the <laughs> amount. But imagine the, imagine the great discoveries they have done out for all of us. The Jennifer Dodna and Emmanuel Sarpentier from Germany and she's from US. Okay, it received 
three million for their dollar three million for their inventions of a of a, of a potentially revolutionized revolutionary tool for editing DNA known as CRISPR. Now let's move to the next one. The two breakthrough paper. One is in Science, the major scientific journal, a programmable dual RNA guide. I'll show you dual RNA guide DNA nucleus in adaptive bacteria. How does bacteria defend the virus? Okay. That, that's the paper appeared in Science in 2012. And the paper came in eLife in 2013 from, from Jennifer from US. And this paper came from Germany from Emmanuel Sharpin here in the subject. The journey started. Now, how does it work? The CRISPR Cas9 is based on RNA mediated adaptive defense systems of bacteria. So, bacteria, the virus, virus attack the bacteria. Okay, the bacteriophage attacks the bacteria, it transports its DNA to the, it infects the bacteria. So, now I'll show you how does it, how the mechanism works, and then we'll go to the example. Now, see what it is. I, I, it's a kind of a, you know, kind of a schematic for students to understand. You know, the technology, the potential, and how it works. So you have a bacteriophage, the virus. It's a bacterial cell. It works. So bacteria uses Cas9 endonuclease to trap the DNA fragment of invading virus. So this DNA is from released from the bacteriophage. It will it has it is, in, it is infecting the bacterial cell. What bacteria does? It has the Cas1, Cas2, the CRISPR associated genes, then the, the nuclei, the, the enzymes which will recognize the, the DNA and chop it. So that it can protect from the infection, and that is the that is the mechanism they identified. So uh, Jennifer and and uh, Emmanuel uh, Sharpentier. Okay, how it is I, in my subsequent slides, you can see that. Remember, I showed you the unique repeats of twenty nine base pairs. Those are your black sequences. It's a CRISPR array. Now think about these blacks are nothing but the repeated sequences of twenty nine base pairs. It was a sandwich model. You have the spacer in between. Right? You have a spacer in between. How does it so spacer? Now, okay. Now you see what happens in the next slide. So this Cas1, Cas2, that it will recognize a short sequence of the bacteriophage DNA and it will cut and incorporate into the bacterial its own, own genome, own gene. And so that next time it can recognize the internet virus. That's the mechanism. So these these spacers. Are nothing but from the bacterial uh, bacteriophage genomic DNA, Cas1, Cas2 cuts it, incorporates it in the in the in the bacterial in the bacterial uh, gene. Okay, um, how does it do? So it's a CRISPR array. There is a trans trans activating CRISPR RNA. It recognizes the complementary strand of the repeat, and you have those spacers. You have those spacers. Okay, this and this this duplex this complex is recognized by the Cas9. And Cas9, by its cleavage domain, it cuts the short, short see it's written, processing of free CRISPR RNA and complex formation with Cas9 endonuclease with trans-activating CRRNA and trans-activating trans -activating CRISPR RNA. And those spaces are, are they by, you know, it, it forms a, it forms a hairpin look structure. I, I have another slide, I think it, it shows. Okay, before that, let me just tell you one more important feature which I forgot to tell you here. The space, the, the PAM, the PAM ah, here. So um, this spacer, this, that, there is another beauty of this mechanism is that the, the Cas9 can recognize only when there are two bases of PAM sequence. It's called protosphere assisted motif. Yes, so basis of sequence. That only it recognizes. If it is not there, it will not recognize. Okay, it's called PAM sequence. Okay, so you see here the PAM, the proto spacer, sorry, not adjacent, adjacent motif next to the spacer, and there it binds, chops it, brings it, and incorporates the bacterial bacterial uh, uh, gene. Okay, in a in a in a in a in a array manner. It is identified from Streptococcus pyogenes. You have like this. It has any any two two double nucleotide the two spacing two two nucleotide sequence that I mentioned. Again. So you see how it is in the space. It's a bacterial the phage DNA. You have the spam here. You have the viral DNA, and this is how the CRISPR array is finally. S9 is the enzyme. It recognizes and then it cuts and incorporates into the bacterial DNA. Okay. So 
this is in short again i have taken this paper from science 2012 the reference you can look at it today with this technology we can with this method we can think about gene therapy we can target at genome editing or even 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 repair of you know a uh, disease cell infected cells in the mammalian system that is possible today so you see this how it is you can in a in a crispr rna and a trans activating crispr rna this duplex recognize this recognize this complementary strand makes a cut no, your non complementary strand is also recognized by the crispr um, and then it makes a cut double stranded break it gets repaired finally uh, it, it gets it gets chopped uh, into the it gets incorporated into the into the, into the, the bacterial genome okay so i'll move to the example now and couple of example i'll show you then it should be able to you should be able to figure out so crispr cas brings plant biology and breeding into the fast lane okay i'll give you some some of the example from plant biology plant science what what amazing discoveries we have now and then i will go back to um, the mammalian system and see what we can so it says that yes the same thing what i said dna cleavage dna modification chromosomal rearrangement the inversion gene targeting and domestication when i say domestication means you have many wild plants those those we like we need to domesticate for for us for our future for our future generation that is also possible now now see this is the first example please note this paper is from pns 2021 amazing discovery has come from university of napoli then white so the dan voiter says lab has done this discovery what it is many of us are familiar with the tissue culture system now what you do is that you can edit a gene for the tissue culture how it is explants move to sterile culture and gene editing reagents gene editing reagents delivered so now you are culturing the explant in the tissue culture medium you have the cas9 as well as the guide rna look at this this enzyme with the guide rna and it will it will it will target the cell and only those cells can be selectively allowed to grow ultimately you will have plants which will be tissue culture derived gene edited plants it you do not require a transformation for that x if you see what it says x plants move to sterile culture and gene editing reagents deliver gene editing reagents means you have cas9 along with the guide rna you can you can you can you can exogenously produce or even exogenously sorry not produce exogenously deliver it will target the cell and make the make the editing precise the as for the guide rna you decide you design there is a little bit of designing involved but it can do that okay gene editing through the de novo meristem induction all there are many people they do they are involved in tissue cultures but you can you can think about a completely gene edited plants by how you see this De deliver developmental regulators what i mean by developmental regulators are that you have you have i don't know how many of you know is called ocel clevata these are um, these are developmental regulators that they dictate the plant development the shoot meristem development you take about um take those developmental regulators dr along with your cas9 and the guide rna you can give in the tissue culture as a result you have a edited shoot like structures formed you can allow them to grow grow finally you have a completely gene edits um edited shoots transfer to soil and these plants are edited plants you can you can think about transmitting that trait to the next generation as well and it shows that the the, the paper clearly describes the pns paper in 2021 very wonderful discovery okay even i before even i i was not aware i, I read that paper to, to to share with you that what the new discovery is the new way to think about the variation of traits because you need variation in traits otherwise you can't and it also allows us to domesticate the wild relative there are examples that right after this similarly gene editing with rna viruses now you see what it is if you have a plant already expressing the cas9 already we have developed the plant which is expressing cas9 what you can do selectively you can trans you can send a guide rna through the viral vector crv or any other viral vector virus will move to the plant and it will either it will do systemic viral spread and it will edit the gene you want it to do as a result you have it's a very high success rate high percentage of progeny have the mutation okay i think it's a brilliant example it came from dan voiter's lab from the pns paper mm. that they published in 2021 okay so uh, future applications for innovative plant design 
Um, okay, we're talking about the, the, the domestication. You can think about de novo domestication. You can think about accelerated breeding. You can think about altering metabolism. You can change the pathway as well. All possible through so this precise way of CISPR mediated gene editing technologies. Okay, I'll move on. There's an example here. You have a wild tomato, and this wild tomato, you can take advantage of all these regulators. These are called TR, the developmental regulators. These are Clavata, these are Ocel, okay, self pruning, SP stamp. These are all developmental regulators. Guide the plant how to grow. You can take advantage of this. You can think about a multiplex gene editing. You can, you can, you can, you know, the way you can think about multiple guide RNAs along with the Cas9, they will go and edit those genes, precisely those genes that you want. As long as your guide RNAs are designed in that manner, you can selectively send one guide RNA, two guide RNA, three guide RNA. As many guide RNAs, up to seven, nine, we have seen the example. Selectively, those genes will be targeted and will be will be will be functionally either um, switched off or even um, you know uh, deletion will happen. And thereby, this example tells you that you can think about wild relatives. Look at the wild plants; its height is shortened. Height is shortened. You have now more yield. That's what we we want to do. Now you can take the advantage of CRISPR. And, and do all sorts of multiplex editing. You can increase the age. You can think about the, the phenotypic <laughs> All right. Ma. So, so that's the example here. It shows here that you see this is the wild plant. Because of this multiplex, multiplex genome editing, the height got shortened. Okay, you have more, more yield. You look at here, this graph at the end, it shows here the fruit length per uh, par width ratio. It's the wild type, and this is the uh, the, the tomato uh, that, that you uh, domesticated. It's a 2021 um, uh, discover um, example that they have published in PNS. Um, similarly, there is another discovery came from another group. No, I, I think it's same group um, from the from Dan Voitas in, uh, in, in in Minneapolis. They showed that natural the natural biotechnology paper that what you can do you can chop off of a plant in the axils, grow the plant, remove the existing meristem. And now what you do, it's your delivery site. What do you want to deliver? You deliver your TES9, your guide RNA, along with the developmental regulations. A method to create shoots that transmit genetic modifications to the next generation. All right. Um, and this, this plant, which will grow from this big excised meristem, it will, it will flower. And then in subsequent generations, you'll get to see the the change of trait, change of yield, change of change of architecture. Okay, it's done so the it, it says here delivery site, you know, meristem meristem formation, growth with fixed modification, segregation of modification of of, of of spring. It will segregate the characters accordingly. Okay, so the the same same example. Those of you interested, you can look at this natural biotechnology paper, twenty twenty. I've given the reference. You can see more about it. Very interesting paper. Very interesting discovery. Now, what it is, you can see, this is another journal which talks about how many crops so far been edited, which are the technologies. You see, there were years, there were times people have used ZFN, talents, and now all CRISPR. And these examples are ZFN and talent, which is the target gene, what sort of repair they have done, homology repair or non-homology repair, what is the target trait, prototypic trait, what they have been able to improve, that talks about. You can take this ZFN genome biology, great scientific paper, and that applications and potentials of genome editing in crop improvement. Look at later on. In the beginning, it was all ZFN talent. Now it is all CRISPR. Okay, you have target gene. You have you have you know which way you would like to make the repair and what sort of target trait you are thinking about. Grass yield of architecture, domestication, all sorts. Of I hope it's getting clear to all of you. All right. Remember, I talked about the gene drive in the beginning. Gene drive is now a, a, a mega way of thinking about, um, you know, controlling uh, that what you like to do. So what it is, CRISPR Cas9 based gene drive. Some genes don't play by the rules. That data sequences called gene drives ensure their survival by by biasing their own transmission to an organism's offspring. A gene drive is a self-propagating me mechanism by which a desired genetic variant can be spread through a population faster than traditional Mendelian inheritance. Look at on the left hand side. It shows here. It shows here. You have a altered allele on the, in the mosquito, and you have a wild type. Now, after fertilization, what will happen? 
you have an altered allele here, it will transmit to the subsequent generation by mentally and inheritance ratio, this one. Okay. But what happens in gene drive? In gene drive, huh, in the gene drive, you have altered gene spread by gene drive. Look at what happens. You have a you have a altered allele here, you have a wild type. When you when you cross, you see what is happening here. You have a Cas9 in the in the locus already engineered, you have a guide RNA and you have an altered element. Now, due to the drive, there will be a double stranded break in the locus. It will be repaired when it HDR, homology dependent repair. After this repair, it will be drive plus altered allele into the, into the locus. Now, when this, there will be cross, if you cross these mosquitoes, what is happening? You have a more than 50% chance, greater than 50% of chance crossing that altered gene via the gene drive. Large number of population will be targeted or now you want to you want to um, you know uh, make them not to infect not to not to transmit the you know you can basically suppress them so this this amazing discovery came so my slide is not huh. so it's a e life uh, paper you can again see concerning rna guided gene drives concern concerning rna guided gene drives for the alteration of wild populations okay is the e life paper what it shows Huh. So, see, huh, that's it. It, it, it. The gene drive and the wild type. Now, gene drive locus, it will match with the wild type. As a result, that already in the locus, you have put Cas9, guide RNA, and the altered allele. Now, you see what will happen because of that. Endonuclease will cut this wild type chromosome. It will make a cut. This one will also be inserted by homologous recombination to the next, next locus, next chromosome. Now, after the after the sorry after the the crossing, it will now it will now populate to the population. More than fifty percent um, locus will be having this altered. Okay, that's the that's called gene drive. The advantage of this method. Applications of CRISPR-Cas9 technology. You see, a CRISPR-Cas9 gene drives targeting double sex causes complete population suppression in a in caged anopheles which anopheles uh, gambi mosquito. It was, a, it was a paper, scientists wiped out a mosquito population by hacking their DNA with CRISPR. That's possible because of the CRISPR. Okay, beautiful discovery. Okay. Um, you may like to read for, for 20 seconds. They might be tiny, but mosquitoes cause millions of deaths every year by spreading disease like malaria and dengue. Not new research suggests we could wipe the destruct, destructive buggers off the map using a genetic engineering technique known as gene drive. If you are willing to risk permanently altering our system. That's it. That's a debate, of course, but this part allows you to make a permanently, you know, this, this mosquitoes, you can permanently make them not infective, not, not uh, you know, it, it will be helpful for human uh, being, human. Okay, three or four examples, then I'm done. You will be seeing here. Now you come back, I have shown you multiple examples in plant. I will show you a couple of examples in therapeutics with respect to um, a mammalian system. You see number of diseases that we get. And majority of this disease, you will see because of the, um, the change in the genetic, genetic, genetic component. For example, you have a Huntington disease. You have Disney muscular dis, uh, dystrophy disease. Okay, These are not curable. Diseases. You cannot be cured. Think about it. But CRISPR allows you to selectively target the gene and, 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 and replace it. That's the advantage. Now, it's because of this. If you see this slide, human genetic variants associated with disease. So there are multiple diseases you can see because of single point mutation. So you look at the percentage of this because of single point mutation. Look at on the right hand side, mutation required to reverse pathogenic point mutation. You can change the mutation and you can reverse it. That's that one. Thing. Okay, this, this, this is taken from Nature Review Genetics 2019. You can think about that, how it is, how it is possible, very targeted way of of, 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 of delivering or even, um, you know, uh, or, or, or selecting the, the, the sequences. Um, here's an example for us to understand that genome editing for disease modeling and gene therapy. Now you look at, you can take out the, the cells from, 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 a, from, from a patient. Now correct those cells in vitro, possible. You now know how to correct it. Now take those cells, you can culture them for some time. And again, you push this back to the, to the mammalian to the mammalian system that you are exper it could be a house mice or it could be something you, you can either infiltrate you can you can uh, 
uh, give the 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 uh, by by injections or even by viral vectors, adenovirus. Okay, you can use you can use those viral vectors and transmit those corrected cells in back to the back to the mammal, back to the human, and it will it will target those genes where what it has to repair for. Another example here, it is also taken from signal transduction and targeted therapy 2020. Um, what it does, you have a cancer cell. Now, cancer cells can be targeted and can be killed. How it is possible? You see, there is a you collect patients' white blood cells, okay, from the, from the patient. You take the T cells, isolate the T cells. Now, with the T cells, you engineered with X, that will express an antigen is called chimeric antigen receptor, T cell and the CART, CART receptor. You can you can engineer them. And after look at the diagram. So this is your T cell. This is your CART receptor antigen. Now you engineer these, in culture them for some time, mammalian cell culture system. Now, and step five, the modified T cells, you can again infuse back to the patient. It will target and kill those tumor cells in there. Okay. Modi need to know more, you can look at this, this, this paper, signal transactions and targeted therapy. 2020. All right. You need that delivery mechanism. Delivery mechanism could be viral or could be non-viral. Now you're non-viral, you have many ways. Either you can take nano, nano, you know, li you know, liquid nanoparticles, you can take polymers, you can, you can use injections, you can take electroporations. And after this, you have the on the left hand side, you have the viral one. And the viral vectors, you have lentivirus, you have adenovirus, you have adeno associated virus. All these help us to transfer the cells of corrected cells of interest to the patient body and, and a targeted recovery mechanism. So you can think about. Look at, look at the, the trials that's going on, the CRISPR mediated clinical trials of gene editing in the treatment of human disease, the number of human disease and applications targets. You have the target, you have the edited cells and what the delivery. All right, signal transactions and targeted therapy gives us a list of trial that going on. For our people. I think CRISPR's, CRISPR's advantage is, is, is enormous. I, you, know, you, can, you can think about those, those pioneers who discovered these mechanisms and made the way for generations to come to think about what we can understand from these techniques. Okay, this is a, this is a summary. In the summary of from 2013 to 2021, what you can think about first liquid nanoparticle delivery for in vivo editing with CRISPR Cas9 in humans. In 2020 was the first trial. Liquid nanoparticle delivery for in vivo editing with CRISPR Cas9 in humans. First, adeno associated virus delivery for in vivo editing with CRISPR Cas9 in humans. This is the, that's why I made it red so that you will know that in 2020, the first trial, first, first, first experiment has been made. Okay. Great power, great responsibility. Okay. Now, <laughs> look at the great power. CRISPR rice increases grain yield 25% in Chinese field trials. Okay. Already we know. That what benefit it has. On the right hand side, you look at another, another, it's a which way you can call scientists discovered the twin babies. Chinese scientist claims he has created world's first gene edited babies. On in the in the October 10, 2018, this uh, 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 Jiangqi is reflected in a glass panel he, and he works at a computer laboratory in Shenzhen in southern China's. Uh, Gangdong province. He helped make world's first genetically edited babies, twin girls whose DNA he said he altered. He revealed it Monday on November 26 in Hong Kong to one of the one of the organizers of an international conference on gene editing. The first evidence that we have. Okay, it's all possible. <laughs> Which way to go? That's only the debate and what to harness from these technologies. Um, um, this is well. I have. I have tried my best to give you uh, the snapshot what I understand. As I said, I'm not an expert. I also learn, I also use CRISPR in my lab, but as I said, it is discovered by somebody. We are using the CRISPR vector, designing the guide RNAs to target the genes in the plant. I'm doing that. We are doing that. And these are, I, on the left-hand side, I gave you two examples here. You think about the, our, our discovery in our lab. Recently, we showed that this is possible. It's a completely architectural change in a potato. We showed that you can make baby tubers, mini tubers all over the parental plant. Okay. We are investigating this mechanism for the last 20 years. Okay. So um, if those of you are interested, you can you can look at the look at my website and look at the papers and read about it, like what it is, how it is possible, what we are we are thinking about. On the right hand side I have given another example here. It's moss. 
we use moss to understand evolutionary questions, like how land plants, all sorts of questions that we can think about looking at a land plant. You need to go back and find out the model organism that can answer those questions that perhaps land plants cannot. So we use moss as a, mo as a model plant, and we have come up with interesting mutants by forward genetics approach, identify that cell to cell communication, cell to cell auxin transports and things like that. So those of you who are interested can look at some of that, some of that. And these are my these are my team members, those who work with, with me. I'm a plant scientist coming here, sharing with you my knowledge, my understanding, what I know by reading the literatures from all sides, both from plant, from therapeutic, from mammalian to plant systems. I try to explain, I try to give my best. I hope you have you have at least got to know and more you can know from reading the literature. Okay, no one is expert. That's what I think. These are my group members. They all work in using this organism, uh, MOSS, and this eight students working only on Um uh, My I have collaborations in within national within India as well as abroad with many many groups. I collaborate and many many papers that we published in last so many years. Not all are listed here. If you if you can have a look at your time. My funding bodies are Government of India, uh, CSIR, ISR Pune. Um, uh, SCRB, the generous funding we received for the last 20 years to, 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 to do the questions we like to chase, we like to investigate um, in our lab. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can stop sharing? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your profound perspectives with us, sir. We are sure that this session would continue to remain very helpful and applicable for us in the time to come. Just a reminder, please be sure to type your questions into the live chat box. We already have a few questions. So let us now move on to the question answer session. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. there is a question from uh, Deepthi KBKU. Is there any commercial crop variety resistant to insect pests developed through talent technology? All right. So answer would be, I showed you one slide. This paper is from Genome Biology. Um, I showed that slide shows you a summary of all the crops there I showed that a number of crops were first targeted by ZFN, the zinc finger nucleus. Then people opted talent. So that list you can, I would refer, I don't remember exactly which crop you're asking me, but I would suggest you go back, browse the journal called Genome Biology and look at ZFN, Talon, and crops, you will be able to find the consolidated list that we now have, the first one information. And then you will also get to the list of crops which are now attempted and targeted by the fish. Okay, sir. There is another question from Akshada Prasad. What is the role of guide RNA? What is the role of guide RNA? Very nice, very interesting yeah. question. So guide RNA is something you design. Remember I said that uh, guide RNA and the CRISPR uh, mm -hmm. trans activating CRISPR RNA. It works in a duplex and it recognizes, and only Cas9 will recognize them. So your guide RNA is the RNA, which you, which there you, you select the basis in a manner that it can it can go and recognize the, the target sequence that it has to cleave from. That's it. It's a, it's a, you have to design this guide RNA from the gene that you are interested in. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Next question is from Deep. The, uh, sorry, Gushbu Gala, can we use gene drive as a method of preserving extinct or nearly extinct species? To preserve extinct species. <laughs> okay, so uh, you may have to refer that paper that I showed you in the e life, the gene drive in 2015 or so. I don't want to remember. That paper may talk about the possibilities of various other ways that we can think about it. The first example I showed you, and I think gene drive allows you to make a targeted approach to make a population wise. I showed you the normal Mendelian inheritance of the transmission of characters. On the other hand, I showed you the population of mosquitoes that were made, that were made completely suppressed. Anopheles mosquitoes. So uh, whether we can do extrapolate to that extent, you have to read a little bit that literature. Thank you. But it's an interesting question. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is from Pooja Pandey. So what is the significant significance of PAM sequence? PAM sequence. So the, the, the sequence of PAM is uh, is a protospacer adjacent motifs, the two bases. That is where it recognized. If it is not there, it will not recognize. So it is it is it is present in the it is present in the in the viral genome. Okay. Uh, 
what is the significance it i mean i need to go a little bit more deep into understand how the complex goes and binds to it so what does this two base pair does if you remove this there is no interaction there is no recognition that's what it says so i showed you by n g g n could be any any sequence and g g uh g g is the g g is the uh, uh, is the protospecial sequence and that's how it does so i my suggestions would be to encourage you to go back and the references that i gave are brilliant references for honestly i'm sharing with you look at the very very authentic literature to, to, to understand the details of it and if you must have note down already the references go back and look at that one slide i showed that where it the cas9 as well as your fish for rna your transacting fish for rna how does it recognize the 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 sequence the bacterial the, the viral genome sequence and protospecer the two two bases it is essential for recognition that's what i mean okay sir next question is from deepthi gulati can this technology be used for genetic disease seroderma pigmentosa well many things require to be investigated right uh, you need to also look at the literature and go back and see what is available um, i'm certain i'm certain that your question is interesting but crispr technology you have seen the wonders of this technology right? such a precise mechanism right and how many years do so you think in next 10 years what can be unfolded you can imagine the potential i mean you have a targeted way of 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 rectifying the defected cell or even the uh, the damaged cell the damage you can see that right in cancer i showed you even in other diseases i showed you how it is possible so many of these and the trials are going on so more i think next 10 years 15 years you will get to see that that the wonders of this technology and what all that we did not think today that we should be able to uh, do it in a, uh, several years from now okay so Next question is from Gushbu Ghala. Can we edit genes in a baby who's not been born? A uh, Chinese scientist edited that in embryo level. If you look at that paper, it was it was edited in the embryo level. That's how. So, um, right after fertilization, I think it was edited. Okay, sir. There is one more question from Gushbu Ghala. Can we use hermaphrodites genes to equalize sex ratio in a particular population? <laughs> I, I i would really say that questions are i now i i am happy that i could at least communicate the message to all of you uh, that gives me a satisfaction because the question that you asked it tells me that you have been thinking along with me i am also thinking and i think we we are all are learner but but nothing is impossible right you can even in hermaphrodite you can like say remember i showed you an example of a wild potato they could domesticate the height is 6 feet they made it to 3 feet they made it to make more tomatoes so how was it done by a multiplexing you they targeted multiple developmental regulators they they besides the thought that if i could target those multiple development regulators maybe first of all i should be able to compress the height i should be able to maximize the yield now you can now you yourself can think about it, isn't it right thank you sir sure. next question is from rutucha lunare can we use crispr in treatment of aids can we can you use crispr in treatment, in treatment of, of AIDS? aids okay so um, we both should go back and li- li- read literature um i strongly encourage um i myself also have to read as i said in the beginning i qualified myself as not an expert so that way i saved myself i don't have to answer your question right away <laughs> so uh, you, you can just just see that what the literature say and where we are it's an acquired immunodeficiency syndrome so whether crispr can target and crispr mediated mechanism can target i think only only we can go and understand the disease first the mode of action of disease and then we can think about how it happens and whether crispr mediated technology can do anything we require to read i i would not be able to comment right away sorry sir uh, okay sir uh, next question is from dr manoj kavdal what is ap genome what is epigenome all right okay so epigenome or epi ep, so it came it has come from epigenetics the epigenome i mentioned one point so epigenome is okay beyond genome so you can think about that what is happening right now we are all concerned about the different changes in the genome and these changes introduce the introduce changes are because of the conditions and normal conditions as well as you are subjecting yourself to different conditions as a result that changes At the at the at the chromatin level, at the histone level, 
which is a, which is affecting the the phenotype okay which is affecting the trait and that genome i'm talking about the epi genome beyond that it's not the the genetics i'm talking about i'm talking about beyond genetics so because of the because of the several environmental conditions of the of the subjective conditions that you are in even stress or anything there are changes happening in the in the genetic in the in the in the histone level and those changes are affecting the gene function and i'm talking about there that how can how can this part can um you know this part can can under, help us to understand that what is happening at that level of modulation of the gene function that's what i mean okay sir there is an, another question from mautik tiwari how can we address the issue of of target mutations when we start talking about human traits it can have deleterious effects with large genome size there can be identical sites of cleavage okay the question is quite big uh, um question um so would you repeat the first part of it again yes sir how can we address the issue of of target mutations oh of target mutations okay how can we address see any any tools or techniques that you can think about there may be some off targets what i mean is that i showed you this slide to you with respect to zfn that there are off target effects often it binds to a non target gene that i am not interested at all why does it bind that is a sequence similarity that means i did not design properly now your design has to be very specific and you have to look at the genomic sequence the target sequence very precisely over and over and think about that can i can i make it very targeted even after doing that also we get off target effects so how to address those off target effects uh, not really not really very clear to me um, but all i would say that if if you when you design the sequence the target sequence you have to make sure that it it is it is it is it is, it is going to bind it should not happen that it has a similar sequence somewhere else and it will bind there and make the off target effects it should chop the some other gene it should not happen how to stop that i would say by by selective strategies precise uh, by by well thought design you can you can you can think about the target sequence and the design yes okay so last question is from pushkalata how do we specifically identify a specific gene to target as there are multiple genes that Let may contribute to a trait yeah so <laughs> wonderful question this you can see in a gene family there could be 10 genes or there could be 60 genes correct <laughs> so even if you target one gene and if you don't if you don't get the desired effect you may think about there is a redundant effect coming from the other gene possible so it is possible even in a family we are now trying i'll, I'll think about I'll, i'll give you an example right now we are trying or we are we have been thinking about that how whether i can target 1 2 3 at the same time it is possible by designing the guide dynamics now um how do you whenever you go and target a gene you have to think about its its function its trait i showed you an example of markensia knob gene the gene which is protein which is essential for ar chamber formations for markensia by single gene targeting single knockout deletion they could completely make it a mutant having no ar chamber right but you may end up with a phenotype that you have still some ar chamber that means you have some genes which are still functioning redundantly in the system you have to think about some other ways so you, you, you need to look at it that which target genes you are thinking about it how many members it has what sequence similarity it has what sort of protein similarity it has and then you decide it's all 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 your choice based all your judgment based decision okay okay so it looks like we have covered all of our questions is there anything as you would like to mention sir uh, as i said in the beginning i i'm happy that uh, they have they have given the due attention that uh, as i said that i'm also a learner uh, i don't claim myself as an and i denied to the uh, denied to dr susan that i don't want to give a popular talk but I, it's an interesting technology and you can say the history i shared with you and what does it tell us what does it i think students you know if you look at the literature it will excite it will give you the stimulation that you know simple discoveries it can lay the foundation of the future the osaka university was you know was not sure what he identified it was a it was a isoenzyme alkaline phosphatase from e coli remember that gene by sequencing the upstream gene then what they did not know what they found <laughs> right 
that's how it is that's exciting it is now you need to go back and read, read the literature keep keep yourself engaged keep yourself reading the literature and 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 enjoy understanding the science that's what i would say thank you once again thank you we are so thank glad you. to have you today sir i would now like to invite dr sarin sir john faculty coordinator department of biosciences uc college for word of thanks thank you ashuti uh, today has been a big day for us to hear from an eminent scientist from isa pune dr anjan banerji head of the uh, r&d department and sir you have initially told us that you are not an expert in the field of gene editing but no 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 but from your talk we had realized that uh, you are not a, not only an expert in the field of uh, your own research but you are an expert in the field of all the current no. research <laughs> it's, it's a wrong interpretation <laughs> current okay. anyway some other yeah, time you can share you out the enormous advantages especially it will be very much useful for the uh, students who are learning uh, enormous advantages of the gene editing its mechanism and also you have pointed out the 30 years of approximately 30 years of uh, research that is going in going through this field so i think you have made a clear cut presentation in the current respective field and the participants also clearly might have understood about their perspectives it's amazing discoveries till date so thank you so much sir for accepting our invitation and also thank you so much for spending your time uh, to share the vast knowledge with us thank you once again my pleasure, my pleasure. i only hope i have i have tried my best dr susan i hope i have yes, i only hope that your your expectations i could elaborate and students are benefited yes, yes sure we all are learners yeah and uh, i must sincerely thank dr adathil vijayan coordinator national science of uh, national academy of science for giving us the, uh, an insight about the activities of the academy and also the support and encouragement that he is giving us and also i must thank Dr. K. V. Peter, former Vice Chancellor of Kerala Agricultural University and President, National Academy of Sciences, Kerala chapter, uh, for the support and uh, for the guidance he has been giving. Also, I must be thankful to Dr. Deepu Matthews, Secretary, National Academy of Sciences, Kerala chapter, who has been giving us the support and help to organize this program. And without the support of this. national academy of sciences kerala chapter this program would not have been materialized so department of biosciences is extremely thankful to the support rendered by the national academy of sciences kerala chapter and all its members thank you so much national academy of sciences and all the members on behalf of the department of biosciences thank you and i must thank our principal dr tarake simon and manager reverend thomas john who have been giving continuous support to the biosciences team and also i am deeply indebted to my mentor and our adjunct professor dr susan ipen the most dedicated and dynamic lady in the scientific community yeah. she is instrumental uh for uh, in, uh, she's the instrumental uh, she's been instrumental for arranging such a kind of great talk always i say she provides us the best so uh, her constant support in all our academic endeavors is very much appreciated thank you for being our strong pillar and motivating us to do best thank you so much ma'am because i i am out of words to say about her because she is always with us for uh, in all our academic endeavors thank you so much ma'am and i must thank our head of the department dr sham mohan for his support and guidance extended and also i thank uh, my teachers uh, i think my many of my teachers also are in this platform and also i thank my colleagues my students especially ashwin ashuti and ashuti for their support and uh, um, participation and also the background support they are being giving and finally i must thank the participants of this webinar because uh, they are the strong pillar and they they have asked excellent questions during the q and a session and uh, we have 
uh, many participants around the globe and my dear participants you are our really a real strength and we have received the excellent uh, questions also and we hope you have enjoyed the presentation and thank you once again for being with us and also i thank ravi shankar sir for participating from the ravi shankar hi anjan it it was great it was great i i hope to i see you and you don't ask me any questions i don't think i can answer <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm joining you from US. It's oh, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it is uh, two thirty a.m. Oh, 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 look at! I think it's inspiring, sir, for all of us. See that? <laughs> <laughs> the talk see that. was so. Thank you very much. I enjoyed. It is good to see you, sir. Thank you. I enjoyed. I enjoyed. Thank yeah. Okay. Thank you all <laughs> once again. Over to Ashwini. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you ma'am. Thank you for participating in today's webinar. We hope you have learned and enjoyed this presentation. Now a Google Forms link will be available in the live chat box and we would appreciate it if you can complete that and provide your feedback. After that you will receive the email within 24 to 48 hours with an e certificate. The link will be active for 15 minutes. We have now come to the end of this session. I wish you all a time full of positivity and productivity. Thank you once again. Thank you Susan. Susan, thank you. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. I'll thank you very much. Like yeah, yeah. Thanks thank for you. invitation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. We'll leave the. Sorry, madam. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Sorry, yeah. madam. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, nice to see you. Nice thank to you. see you, sir. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. And we woke you up from your sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I I've been awake. It's now two thirty a.m. <laughs> you can sleep any more. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. a good opportunity. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll leave. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.